Hello, my friends. This is Pastor Jerry Cannon. I want to thank you so much for being a part of our Mother's Day worship service. Today's message is to inspire, also to encourage mothers of all generations that God has a calling upon your life. Let us go to the Word now and worship God. Today, my friends, I want to call your attention to a portion of verse 28, for I believe it serves as the backdrop as well as the foundation of this Mother's Day message. For the Bible says, now I am giving him to the Lord and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. Will you read that with me, please? Now I am giving him to the Lord, and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. And my friends, with the aid of the Holy Spirit and your encouragement today, I want to lift up this text, and for a brief moment, I want to preach on this subject dedicated to God dedicated to God. If you can, smile at your neighbor with your mask on and ask them, are you dedicated? What did they say? Yes, no, maybe. And they didn't give you a good answer. Tell them, say, this sermon's for you. Amen. <laughs> matter of fact, matter of fact, just say it with me. Say, this sermon, this sermon is for me. Amen. Amen. For the Bible says, now I am giving him to the Lord and he will belong to the Lord his whole life. But Tony, it's been said that a wise man once described a mother as a woman who combines the practical and the spiritual into one life. Can I get an amen there? The description that this person wise man gave, it goes on to say that a mother wipes little noses, mends little clothes, washes little faces, and points little eyes to the stars and the little souls of eternal things. It's been said, my friends, that the strongest influence in any person's life is in their home. Can I get an amen there? For good biographies, Dr. Monroe, never began with their subject, but with the parents or the grandparents of the subject. And I think that is a statement for somebody that's very true sitting in church today or watching or listening over the airways that your biography, your resume, your genesis point of you becoming who's who was all made possible because of a parent, a grandparent, an aunt or an uncle or somebody who showed you the way. How about saying hallelujah right there? You see, the point that I want to start out on this Mother's Day to really lift up this Mother's Day service is that I want to declare before you in the sanctuary and watching right now that only God can measure the influence of a mother's life and only God can, can determine the outcome of your life based on the mother to which gave you birth. Only God has that power to determine your end. Matter of fact, the Bible says he knows your end before your beginning. And the God that we serve and the God that we love and the God that we worship, I believe is that kind of God that puts mother figures in our lives and mother persons in our sphere and mother images all around us to make us more faithful to Almighty God. Uh, let me see if I can quote Lisa Leslie, that WNBA most valuable player. She says it about this, a mother. She says, my mother was my role model before I even know what that word was. 
Can anybody say, I know what Lisa is talking about, that your mother was your role model, your mother was that image, that was the person that you wanted to imitate, that was the person that you wanted to be like. See, children, y'all, mirror their mother's outlook on life and copy her every habit. That is why mothers, you must be prayed of. That is why mothers, you must you must be Holy Ghost stuff. That is why mothers, you must know the Lord for yourself. Let me see if I could share a little bit uh, of, of what I found in an article, uh, Sister Valerie. That article was entitled, What My Mother Taught Me. And I think as I read some of this, you might agree, Miss Sony, that your mama taught you the same thing. To hear it is the first thing. It says, my mother taught me about religion. For my mother said to me, if I spill grape juice on that carpet, you better pray that stain comes out before I get home. Somebody say amen. My mother taught me logic. She says, from her decisive words, when I had questions, my mama simply says, because I said so. My mother, my mother taught me foresight. I love this one. She says, she says, make sure you wear clean underwear in case you get into an accident. My mother, my mother, she taught me irony. She says, keep on crying and I'll give you something to cry about. My mother, my mother, she taught me behavior modification. She says, stop acting like your old daddy. My mother, my mother, she taught me, here it is, the circle of life. I brought you in this world. Oh, that's right. You can learn some things from your mama. You see, what I want to lift up today as we look at this passage in 1 Samuel, the, the story that we're focusing on, y'all, is the family of Elkaniah. Elkaniah, y'all, was a, a prosperous man. We don't know the region to which he lived in, but from his genealogy, it's, it's, re, it's recorded that he was from a respectful family. And the story indicates, my friends, that he's a pretty devout man as well. He travels every Every year to Shiloh to worship at the tabernacle with his family. And not only that, but it seems he's pretty successful in his traveling because when he goes, he takes an offering and he takes a sacrifice for and with his family. And even more, y'all, the Bible indicates that Elkanah has two wives. Okay, you're not getting it. The Bible says that as he goes to worship, he takes his family and his two wives. I don't know why or how he came about two wives, but the Bible indicates that his first wife was Hannah and his second wife was Penina. Now, Penina is the wife who has the children and, and Hannah is the one who has his first love. But Penina, she carries the children and Hannah, she carries the pocketbook. Penina, she is the one that gave birth to the children and Hannah is the one that gave life to Elkanah. We don't know why he has two wives. Maybe because it was one of those kinds of cultural things is that if the first wife couldn't have a child, then he was allowed to get a second wife to have children. I don't know if Hannah and Penina had an agreement like Sarah and Hagar. We're not sure of that but the Bible says that he has two wives. Now I got to pause there parenthetically because it's hard to love two. Show ain't easy to do. It's hard to love two. Show ain't easy. Come on, you know what, what, what William Bell says. He, he says, got a woman at home who's sweet as she can be. I got a woman on the outside crazy about, come on, don't act like y'all been in church all your life. Trying to love two. It ain't easy. To do, I don't know why he wanted to love these two women, but the Bible says that the first wife he loved more because even at the moment of sacrifice, brother Jay, it says he gave a panana, uh, uh, he gave her the sacrifice for she and her boys and her girls, but to Hannah he gave a double portion. He gave a double portion to the one who did not have a child. And somebody needs to understand that is how God also operates. That's how God moves in your life. You may not have what somebody else has, but my God will meet your need. 
You may not have what somebody else or live where they live, but God will provide a roof over your head. God will provide substance for your soul. God will provide peace in the midst of Is there anybody here who can say, Reverend, that's my story. That's my testimony. I might not have what you have. I might not go where you go. I might not dress like you dress, but my God makes a way out of no way. My God has a way of crossing T's and dotting I's. My God can come through in the lick of time. My God can still hit a straight lick with a crooked stick. My God can do all things but fail. Oh, church, hear what I'm saying this morning because I want you to recognize on this Mother's Day as we celebrate all kinds of mothers, I am sensitive and I am aware that we all go through different situations at different times and motherhood means something totally different to us all. And I got to say this as a, as, a, as a footnote here, we've got to move away from that fairy tale image of motherhood. We've got to move away from that, from that Hollywood image of motherhood. You see, when you look at the Bibles, the scriptures are replete, y'all, to let us know that you had mothers in the Bible like Ruth, who was left childless in her first marriage. Rachel, who was infertile. He had, you had Sarah, who was infertile. In the Bible, we hear about Eve, who lost her son to tragic murder by another son. We read about Mary, who lost her son at the crucifixion of the state. We read about uh, two mothers of two kings of the same name of Isaiah who encouraged them to be wicked and unjust. We read about the prodigal mother and the other prodigal sons. One son who wanted to take the money and run and another son thought he was better because he stayed home. Scripture gives us story on top of story of women when motherhood has not been no crystal stair. We have to understand that motherhood is hard and motherhood is painful and motherhood keeps you up at night and motherhood does not I have all the answers in the good book but I have you to know right now that God always speaks to mamas and God always lifts up mamas and God always protects mamas when mamas go to God in prayer look at the text y'all because I want you to understand that God and God alone through God's son Jesus Christ is the one that we come to worship and to praise and to honor this Mother's Day we, we've got to understand that Christ is just like the quote from Susan Gale she says that mothers are like glue even when you can't see them they're still holding the family together anybody got some glue mamas if you beside your mother today, I want you to say, Mama, you ain't nothing but some good old glue. Good, good old glue. Good, good sticky, wicky glues. Good, good Elmer's glue. Good, good. When I thought I was falling apart, I could dial them digits and Mama, you were. When I thought I was about ready to lose my mind, Mama, you were there. Funny story. I don't know how to say funny, but interesting story. They said a man was on his way to buy some flowers for his mother on Mother's Day and outside the flower shop was a little girl and she was sitting there with a sad face, tears rolling down her eyes and the man asked, can I help you? He, she says, well, yes, sir. They, I want to buy some flowers for my mother, but I only have 75 cents and it costs a total of $2 in order to get two roses. The man says, that's no problem. Come on with me. I will take you in and buy those flowers. And of course, as he bought the flowers for the little girl, he ordered some flowers to be sent to his mama. And he went back outside. He asked the little girl, can I help you? Is there anything else you need? She says, well, can you give me a ride? She says, yes. Tell me where you want to go. And surprisingly, y'all, the little girl directed the man to drive to the cemetery. When he got to the cemetery, the little girl took those two roses, went to a freshly dug grave and put the flowers on that grave and at that moment the man went back to the flower shop, canceled his order and drove the 200 miles to see his mama. Can I speak to you this Sunday because I want you to recognize why you have your mama spend some time with your mama. Why your mama is here, let mama know that you love her. Regardless of how you may have a bridge or a wall between you and mama, trust me, when mama's not here, you're going to wish you would have mama to talk to. 
You see, what I want you to understand, my friends, is that Hannah is a mother, but Hannah is a mother with a problem. And I want mamas to know right now that great mamas have great problems. Can you say problems? Now, okay, you didn't want me to say that to you, mamas. You wanted something that sugar-coated with some icing on it so we can hurry up and get the brunch. But let me just exegete the text because it starts out that Hannah has a problem. Her problem, y'all, is she, is she is not able to produce children. She cannot have children. The Bible says that God has closed up her wound. And because of that hurt, that deep hurt, Hannah takes her problem to the Lord in prayer. Deeply hurt, she pours out her heart with great anger. It's deeply hurt. She prays to God. She, she, she's hurt God. She's hurt y'all because the woman, the other woman of, that she's sharing, uh, the co-wife has children. She has children running on top of children. Isn't that interesting y'all? Is that sometimes the people who want to have children can't have children and those who got children don't want the children that they have. Isn't it interesting, y'all, sometimes that people who want to be parents can't be parents, and those who are parents don't want to fulfill the role of a parent? Isn't it interesting, y'all, that how God will put this story in the Bible not to punish you or to let you know that you're less than, but I believe God puts the story in the Bible so many of us can flip the pages of God's holy word and get some encouragement. You see, verse 19 and 20 is important because it says to us then, the Lord remembered Hannah after she prayed. Why? Because the Lord had kept her from conceiving. That's verse 6, but verse 19. 19 and 20 it says the Lord remember Hannah okay you didn't get it so let me give it to you again in verse 6 she's hurt in verse 19 and 20 she's helped okay when the story starts out y'all she goes to the temple to worship when the story starts out y'all she's got an antagonist the co-wife y'all the co-mother in the same house where she is always sticking it in her face and grinding it in her spirit that I'm more than you because I have children and you don't come on you know how children can be sometimes na 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 taking the tongue out and being a knee you know it's something about when somebody needles you who you don't know but it's another thing when somebody needles you in the same house you living in test one is this on test it's one thing when you have people who who get on your nerves on the job but when you come home you got to deal with that foolishness okay all right Let's be honest. It's one thing for you to want something and can't have it, but it's another thing for you what you want and somebody else has it and they rub it in your face. And instead of Hannah being like some of you and me and our cousins are trying to fight fire with fire, Hannah fights it with prayer. And I got to drop my kickstand right there for somebody to give God a shout right there. When people get on your last nerve, don't go back to them getting on their nerves. Take it to the Lord in prayer. When somebody tries to undercut you, I want you to lift them up with the word of Almighty God and take it to the Lord in prayer. When somebody tries to say that you're less than, I want you to tell them that I am all that I'm supposed to be because I take it to the Lord in prayer. You see, we learned some lessons from Hannah. Number one, we have learned faithfulness of her commitment. Number two, the transparency of her trial. Number three, the dedication to her promise. Here it is, faithfulness, transparency, and dedication. Hannah, y'all, she teaches us some valuable lessons because the birth of Samuel into Hannah's life, y'all, was an answer to her prayer. Samuel, y'all, y'all, was the answer to Hannah's prayer, but Samuel, y'all, was also the connection of God's children. When you read the Bible, the Hebrew Bible, you will find out that first Samuel, y'all, it comes after Judges in the Hebrew Bible. And our new standard living Bible is farther after that because God was trying to say in the people of their whole culture that I'm getting ready to put a person who's going to be a judge 
church and a prophet and somebody committed to me. Now, as a sidebar, I want you to recognize that her commitment, y'all, her commitment to Almighty God happened through the power of prayer. For prayer, again, is the answer to distressful circumstances when we are in deep sorrow and our heart is broken. Prayer is the answer. Prayer is the answer to distress, distressful circumstances. Whatever you may be facing, I don't want you ever to forget to go to God in prayer. Old school, help me on this. Help me say this. Take it to the Lord in prayer. Okay, you're not getting that. Have a little talk with Jesus. Tell him all about our troubles. He will hear our faintest cry and answer by and by. You've got to be, be a faithful disciple and whatever stresses you out, you have to take that stress to the Lord. You see, the Bible, the Bible is replete, y'all, for helping us recognize that Hannah first requested to the Lord to give her a son. She was faithful, y'all, in her commitment. God, if you give me this, then I will do that. And how many of us will confess, tell about two or three Jesus, tell about two or three of, of the disciples and maybe Jesus that you asked for something, but you didn't follow through? Okay. Y'all too honest. Let me go to this side. How many of y'all over here say, Reverend, that's my story. I've asked God for one thing, and when God gave it to me, I got selective amnesia and forgot the promise I made to the Lord. Is that your story? Okay, four of y'all over this. Let me go to this side over here. Again, Reverend, let me tell you what it was really like. I asked God to lift me up, and as soon as I got lifted up, I put somebody else down. Reverend, I asked God to make a way straight for me, and as soon as I got on the straight and narrow, I went back to something. That, is that your story this Sunday morning? All right, let me speak to those who are watching online. You know good and well you are where you are, are having what you have and doing what you're doing, not because of what you have done, but because of the power of Almighty God. You see, when I say great mothers have great problems, recognize that Hannah's problem, y'all, was something that she could not solve on her own. It was the power of God that had to open up her womb. Verse 6 says that God had closed her womb, but verse 20, 19 and 20 says that God heard her prayer and opened up her womb. She had a great problem, y'all, but I want somebody to know with a problem that your value to God is not based on your ability to reproduce. God loves you because you are made in God's own image. Your value to God is not because you can have a baby. Your value to God is because God calls you God's child. See, the good news on this Mother's Day is that you've got to recognize that God has placed in all of us a desire. God has placed around all of us a hunger. God has placed in all of us a space that only God can reside. And I guarantee you, once you hold on and find that space, God will not only move things in your life, but God will move people, the right people, to your life. Let me see, Miss Ruth, if I could give that quote to Dr. Maya Angelou. She says it this way. She says, a woman's heart should be so hidden in God that a man has to seek him just to find her. Somebody say amen. Sisters, you ought to say that's my word right there. That your heart is so, so, so connected to God that you can't get to me unless you go to God. And I don't know who you're with. I don't know who your partner is. But I just believe that if you want to get to somebody who is about something, who is connected to God, you've got to get your relationship to God right before you try to get somebody else's relationship to God together secondly. Here's what the Bible teaches us, y'all, is that, is that Hannah had a way of setting her priorities toward God. She had a personal uh, relationship toward God. She had a relational relationship toward other people. If we are going to be the people that Almighty God calls us to be, dedicated to Almighty God, we got to have our priorities right. Priorities right, first of all, with God, and secondly, with God's people. Why do you say that, Reverend? Because when the text is, is giving us some understanding, it, it gives us some directions that, that Hannah's heart was right with God. The Bible says, 
Eli sitting in his position of authority. Eli sitting in his seat of judgment. Eli sitting as the priest of the temple. She, he, he watched Hannah pray. He heard, he, he, he saw her lips moving. He, he observed her posture. But the Bible says he heard nothing coming from her lips. You see, the Bible says that Eli, though he was a man of God and a priest in the temple, was human. And I got to drop my kickstand there to let somebody know that though you are human, though you are righteous, and though you are saved, and though you are in the church, you're still human. Okay, they didn't get it. Though you are that person that God has called out and God has given a new way of life and God has put a word in your spirit, I want you to remind yourself that I'm still human. You see, if you forget that, you can be like Eli in the text because the Bible says, Miss Miller, is that Eli sat there in essence with a judging eye. He looked at, looked at Hannah, her, her, her lips were moving, but no noise was coming from her mouth. Her, her lips were going, and, and it seems like that, that she was just, that the Bible says he thought that she was drunk. Now, the, the caution to the wind there is that in order for me to know that you're drunk, I got to know what drunk looks like. Okay, they got quiet on me now. In order for me to say you look high, that means I got to know what high. Thank you, Oak. We've got some honest people over here. Thank you so much. In order for me to say you look pregnant, that means I don't know what pregnant. Okay, if I want to accuse you and I want to say, "Mm, you must be a fast little somebody, that means I must know what. Fast is, okay? In order for me to say that mm, you ought to be st- you ought to stop doing all you ain't nothing but a hypocrite, that means I don't know what. You see, I like the way that Brother Terry Anderson says. He says, we got to stop being the morality police when it comes to church. You got to stop acting like that you all that you always been saved, you always been righteous, you always been lifting the holy hands. No, sugar baby, the reason you don't chase women right now because you old. The reason you ain't got but one man in your life right now because you old. That's all you you can't do what you used to do. And don't act like you ain't never done it before. Is this thing on? I, where's Brother Lester? Somebody talk to me. I, Eli, of all people, was trying to throw shade on Hannah when Eli's own boys, the Bible say in verse two, in chapter 2 and 3, die on the same day because of their ill spirit, because of their wickedness. No, sugar baby, sweep around your own front door before you try to sweep around mine. Quit trying to tell me how to handle my marriage when your rag- marriage is raggedy and rock. But quit trying to tell me how to raise my children when your children are cuckoo for cocoa puff. Quit trying to tell me how to act and how to be a man when you don't know how a man ought to act in the first doggone place. You see, you got to have a personal relationship with the Lord. And I like that. I like that, Brother L, because Hannah didn't let what other people said about her stop her from worshiping Almighty God. And somebody in church on Mother's Day, somebody watching right now, I don't want you to stop being the person you are because you haven't received or gotten all the things you have asked for. You see, here's what's important for us. I like the way that Jody Peacock says that Jody is that author, that writer, that Princeton graduate. You may not know all of her books of fiction. You may have watched and read Wonder Woman. She is the writer for Marvel's Wonder Woman. But here's her quote. She says, says, the very fact that you worry about being a good mom means that you are one. Mamas, that's your shout out right there. If you've ever wondered how in the world can I be a good mama? How in the world can I do better? How in the world can I be stronger? The very fact, as Jody Peacock says, that you worry about it is an indication that you are one. 
meaning that you're worrying because you know you want to be your best. You're worrying because you realize you want to do your best. You're worrying because you recognize that God is placed to call upon my heart. You see, when we make a promise to God, we must fulfill our promise. That's what Hannah teaches us. When we make a promise to God, we must keep our word. That's what Hannah teaches us. When we make a promise to God, we must do what we say we're going to do. The Bible says is that after she had this child, when, when Elkanah says we're going back to the Lord's house to worship on the Lord's day at the temple of the Lord, Hannah says, no, I'm staying here. No, I'm going to raise my child. No, I'm going to wing my baby from my, from not just from my bosom, I'm going to wing my baby and teach him how to live in the presence of respect and dignity. You see, it's not just that she waited till the baby was three months, four months, five years we know in that day and time sometimes the child was four, five and six years old still nursing from his mother but what Hannah says not only do I want to teach my child but I want to be a role model for my child. Don't miss that, y'all, because on Mother's Day, I think we can give a shout out to the role mothers, role mothers and the role models to which God has placed in our lives. Some, some role model that helped you stay on the straight and narrow. Some role model who helped you stay prayed up. Come on, give God thanks. Some role model who put $5, that holy handshake when you left church and that made a difference in your life. Some role model who sent you a text. Some role model who call you. Some role model who stopped you from running down the halls. Boy, you're going to bust your head wide open. Some role model who said you need to act up. Pull your britches up. Put some clothes on. Pull that skirt down and cover your... Somebody who says, I love you so much that I want to pour inside of you. See, what I learned from the text, y'all, is that the, the, the role model that Hannah wanted her son to, to follow was going to be in the church in the church, in the temple. That's why she says, I'm going to lend his, his, him to you. I'm going to give my son to you. I'm going to dedicate my son back to you. She recognized, y'all, that the role model for her child would be seen in the church. And there's a question there for the church of Jesus Christ. That's why we got to take a checkup from the neck up and make sure that we are living the kind of life that when people come in the church, they want to be like us. Come on, help me say that again. We got to be careful, y'all, how we live our lives in the church because there's somebody coming in the church to see what a Christian looks like, talks like, acts like, and when they're going to leave the church doing what they saw us do in the church. You see, so if you, if you, if you all are, are uptight and, and stingy and selfish, recognize you ain't a good role model in the church. I'm not saying you shouldn't come to church, but when you come to church, don't act like you ain't been in church. All right, Miss George, they got quiet on that one, so I, I'm going to move quickly, but I'm going to say it again. When you come to church and you got an attitude, be careful because somebody's watching you in church with your attitude. And if your attitude stops them away from being a believer in Almighty God... The Bible says it's like tying a millstone around your neck. The Bible says you got to be careful how you act and how you talk and how you approach people and, and how you respond. If you can't say something good, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. Here, here we go, here we go. <laughs> Hannah teaches us we must fulfill our promise, we must keep our word. We must do what we say. That's, that's why I come to the close of this sermon, giving a shout out, y'all, to Allison Felix. Allison Felix, don't know if you know her story, y'all, is one of the most decorated Olympians of all time. She has, she has three gold medals, about four or five bronze medals. She has a total of 13 medals, y'all, as a track star. Now, what I shout this yeah, this her story, y'all, is because on April the twenty, April the twelfth of twenty twenty two, just a couple of weeks ago, Allison announced that this is her last year of running. Why? Because she says she wants to dedicate herself to her daughter. Her daughter, y'all, was delivered by a cesarean uh, operation. Her daughter, y'all, was twenty three months when she came into the earth on an ICU NIC unit, shall we say? That's her daughter, y'all, Cameron. 
daughter, her daughter, y'all, is a blessing, an answer to our prayer. Now, again, this is the most decorated uh, of track and field female uh, uh, that has ever run the Olympics. But here is her story. She says that now that she is a mother, now that she has come through the COVID pandemic, now that she has all these medals, it is her story, y'all. She says to give back as a mother, to use her platform. Don't miss that. She's saying that now that I've achieved these things, I recognize I have a platform to speak up for those who can't speak for themselves. Now that I've achieved these things, I have a platform to make sure my daughter does not have to go through the struggles that I went through. Now that I've achieved these things, she says I want to reach back and be a value add to somebody else. Okay, you th I think you know where I'm going. Here's her quote. She says, I really want to show my daughter what it's like to overcome adversity and what hard work is like and how character and integrity are important to anything you do. Here is what Allison Felix says. It makes me want to shout, y'all. She lets it be known that now that I've done these things, I recognize it's my responsibility to give back. You see, that's what the text was all about because that's what the sermon title is, dedicated to all mighty God. Allison is saying that because I have reached that goal, I have reached that conclusion of my professional career, I am so satisfied with where I have. I am completely there with my giving. I've got to give back. Okay, Allison is saying that basically I've, 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 I'm married, I, I'm an athlete, I, I know what it's like not to have children, I know what it's like to have a child, but I recognize that in this current moment, my goal, my direction is to give back. You see, she could give back because she says, I want to dedicate my life, my being, my presence to Almighty God. Thank you so much for being a part of this worship experience. Today, as we lifted up God's word and honored mothers, we pray that you too receive the word that encourage you to be a more faithful disciple. This is Pastor Jerry Cannon and members of the C.N. Jenkins Presbyterian Church thanking you so much for being a part of this worship experience. Have a wonderful day. Here we go, here we go. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May heaven shine upon you. May God be gracious to you this day and forevermore. Happy Mother's Day. May God love you with God's spirit in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Ghost. Come on, give God a hand clap of praise for who God is, how God loves, and how God moves in this space. Y'all be blessed. Love to see you next week. God bless you.